Welcome back to All Up In Your Business. My name is Brian Piszczacek here, joined once again by our Chief Development Officer, Natalie Ruiz. Natalie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. Great. What's been going on in the world of Natalie Ruiz lately? Oh, it's, it's uh, well, as you know, we're moving, right? Yeah. We're moving from the lofts over at Wolfpin Creek Visit College Station over to 1207, the old fire station in front of City Hall. So a um, lot of boxes, a lot of... Uh, purging and uh, getting moved in, getting relocated. Yeah, every time I move, it reminds me how much I hate moving. Exactly, so. and, and how much stuff you accumulate over time, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hopefully this is where we'll, where we'll be, our permanent, whole, uh, permanent right. spot, and I'm super excited about it, and uh, definitely a future, I think, opportunity for another podcast to talk about 1207 and the future space and where tourism intertwines with ED, so very exciting. I like how you think. Oh, yeah. Right, so today we're gonna to talk about redevelopment. Okay. So a uh, critical factor, it's uh, very important uh, as a city grows. Obviously College Station is still a young city, incorporated in 1938, so it's different than some, but you know, we're getting to a point now where, uh, as we'll get into a variety of changes, where redevelopment is really critically important about utilizing the space in its highest and best use. Right. And, you know, highest and best use, that's a that's a great real estate term, right? When you when you talk about uh, the use of a particular piece of property, I think when it uh, in terms of a city planning perspective, there are pieces of property that that either need to be redeveloped, they may be underperforming, underutilized. Um, But something that that I think is key here in College Station is that those are areas that already have infrastructure. We've already we've already paid for the infrastructure we're maintaining streets our fire and police are already providing services there so it doesn't put a burden on uh, existing services that are already there so it's really key in making sure that you're you're utilizing those those areas that may have been skipped over previously uh, with development or it's maybe time for something new and and fresh on that property yeah and I think Generally, from an economic development standpoint, the, the purpose is to grow and diversify the economy. Right. And, and to do that, a lot of times density comes into play. And there have been myriad factors, again, as the city has developed in terms of sort of limiting a lot of available green space. So to me, that's why that, that infill and redevelopment piece is so critical. Yeah, I think you know back back in the old days, right? You would uh, your your population continues to grow, and your physical size of the city would grow as well. You would annex properties um, that would be the next area for development and extension of utilities. The state has really limited that in the last you know five or so years, and that it is very difficult to annex anymore. So you really got to do the most with what you have available uh, in, in a city if you're going to grow and diversify, and if you're going to be able to house the population that that wants to be here in College Station. Yeah, so let's get a little theoretical, I guess, uh, in, in terms of talking about a city's role. And okay, if we're talking about redevelopment, what, what role can a city play in that? And I, I feel like we've, we've really kind of distilled it down into three primary areas, or at least the way that I sort of think about things. And I can get in kind of definitionally into it, but kind of a passive approach, uh, sort of as a facilitator and then as an active developer. So from a passive perspective, to me, that's, that's still market driven. Um, I think the, that's, that to me is, is a case of kind of the city setting the table, really creating an environment for, for those redevelopment opportunities. What, what do you think of when you're, when you're talking sort of passively and setting the table, what does that, what does that look like from a city perspective? You know, I think there's a couple of key factors there. I think one from a comprehensive plan standpoint, you know, the comprehensive plan lays out the physical development of the city. Um, I think having uh, having thought that out ahead of time so that when a property is ready to redevelop or a developer wants to come in and invest, that the, the plate is already set, right? You know where the streets are going to go or you know where um, those land uses are appropriate and where they're not appropriate. So having, having a very... Um, up-to-date comprehensive plan I think is key. I think it's also being a community that uh, folks want to invest in, right? If I'm going to uh, invest in College Station, I want to make sure I've got a low tax rate, I've got a very efficient government, um, that that the development process is going to be predictable, that, that I know if I meet all of the the code requirements that I'm able to to invest. Also, if I'm a business owner, I want to make sure that it's a place that one I want to live, and that a place where I, my employees are going to live and send their kids to school as well. Yeah. All right. So checking a lot of those boxes for College Station, then to me taking it up at another level. So it's okay. There's there's an incentive for the city to play a more active role in, in something beyond again uh, tax rate quality of life amenities, kind of that infrastructure that's in place. To me, that becomes more then of a of an active facilitator. And I think we've seen that manifest in ways like 
development agreements um, to incentivize either infrastructure or bringing somebody in, a, a, a business owner of a particular type, um, through these incentive agreements. Right. I, I think um, once you once you've outlined the the development piece of it, incentive agreements are very important. Um, I think there's also additional work that could go into making sure the taking that next step after the comprehensive plan, making sure the zoning's in place, making sure that the real estate entitlements are there, so that if a developer wants to come in and develop in accordance with your code that that the red carpet's laid out right they don't have to fight you to meet your own plan and to and to meet the zoning requirements mm -hmm. so i think i think that's a way um, that we work together incentives also identifying you know our council has a strategic plan and they identify areas or types of uses that they would like to see us go after in a more aggressive way entertainment uses is one that that we've gone after directly um, we haven't quite used incentives yet but that's not completely off the table um, but but i think there's there's a lot of different ways up to uh, purchasing the property and, and having uh, a much more aggressive role when it comes to a redevelopment when you don't own the property, again, those those incentive agreements are a way for the city to to again incent the development in a way that is something that I think is consistent with with where we're trying to go from right. a kind of a holistic standpoint. So, to me, a great example of that is Providence Park. It's located on Highway Six, um, sort of near the the new Academy site. Now, that was a building uh, or a or a location that was a redevelopment opportunity. I think roughly around 2016. It's about 100. 80,000 square feet redevelopment that we worked with the developer on that? Yes, and it, and it was relatively vacant at, at that time. Also, what was happening in our community is we were working very closely with Texas A&M, who was really investing on their research. Life sciences was an area, it was an industry that we saw a lot of growth opportunity here, but there weren't locations for those businesses to land or that technology to spin out. And so we worked with the new owner of the Westinghouse facility and just you know, had a real honest conversation about what it is that, that they needed to redevelop and what it is that we would wanna see as a city. And so we put together an agreement that was basically, if you go after some of these life science companies and really try to develop a larger campus, then we would provide incentives, nothing um, that was a ton of money, but fast tracking their, their permits. There was also, they would get a rebate of a certain amount of the additional value that they added to the tax roll. So if they generated an extra thousand dollars in uh, property tax to the city, then we would reimburse a percentage of that to them as well. So it was a, it's a small incentive, but it also encouraged them to invest. And what we've seen is this year that property is going to be 100 percent leased, uh, which hasn't been the case since Westinghouse left, what, late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also seeing the life science industry really grow here. We've got Matica and Zoetis that have their uh, their headquarters there as well and are operating out of that facility. Mm -hmm. So that's for a relatively small investment. Um, it's, it's really paid dividends for the city. Yeah. Another area of town that I think we, we had a different approach, but similar in terms of the facilitation aspect, some significant changes to, to the uh, UDO, the development ordinance, right. a lot of infrastructure improvements in the Northgate area. Um, you know, another way to do that sort of near and dear to my heart, I worked for years on the CDBG side, um, is leveraging federal funds through a facade improvement program in, in Northgate. And I think all of those things, I think, combine to manifest in what you see now with it's like, yeah. you know, multiple uh, student student housing high rises go up all across Northgate. Right. And and, you know, this coming from that that community development world, too, is the reason we were able to use those federal funds is because it was designated as a slum and blight area, right. which you right. go to Northgate now, and I, I think folks that have that uh, haven't been to Northgate in the last ten years would could relate to that. Mm -hmm. Folks that that are that are current residents just don't relate to that at all. But it used to be an area of a lot of code enforcement, a lot of tickets. Um, a lot of uh, dilapidated structures over there that we participated in the facade improvement. So it's in my mind, it's really using those tools that you have available to you um, to encourage redevelopment, reinvestment, and what it is that you want to see there as, as a community. So then kind of taking it, taking it to that final step. So we're, we're facilitating, but in a different way. This to me is, is, again, the city as a developer where we actually own the property. So we can handle the entitlements, we handle that piece, but then we're we're 
really seeing the process all the way through. And typically, I, I think the way that you've seen that is through our business parks. The Midtown Business Park is a great example of something that I think is really teed up for future success. College Station Business Center is, is uh, I think, probably a more mature version of that mm -hmm. in terms of where businesses have landed in the past. But maybe like a cost code that ended up ultimately on what was what's designated as the commercial tract of that Midtown Business Park. Right. Where did where did that come from and how did that conversation go, you know, sort of as an economic development professional and representing the city as the developer with the interest in that property? Well, it, it's certainly very different from the more passive approach, right? Yeah. Um, and, and investing uh, taxpayer money into uh, becoming a, a private developer. What we typically see throughout Texas and other communities is that municipalities, county governments, other cities, they uh, will take this approach when it comes to a business center. And, and the reason they do that is because you can talk about diversifying your economy and having a very solid economic foundation, but if you don't have jobs that will employ your residents, everything else doesn't really matter, right? If you can't afford to uh, buy a home and, and, and shop in your community and really live in your community. So that's, that's the one time where a lot of municipalities will get involved because you want to be very patient and encourage those companies that are gonna have very good, high paying jobs with benefits that, that will employ your citizens. And so you typically see that throughout the country that uh, communities will get involved in that aspect because typically a private developer would fill that role in a more traditional residential or commercial development. But when it comes to those primary jobs, there's a lot of overhead that you have to cover that as a city or a county, you wouldn't necessarily have to. You can be a little more patient and use that to encourage those higher paying, highly skilled jobs in your community. Now, the Costco uh, development came out of that was originally a larger piece of property about 400 acres that was for a business center that we purchased 20 years ago mm -hmm. um, over time we really started seeing pressures for more commercial on highway 6 and that was a uh, around 2017 2018 is when we went to council and said hey do we really think that this frontage of highway 6 should remain as that future industrial or should it be more commercial because here are the demands that we're seeing and that's how costco came was was there was a rezoning and putting that back out for the private development world so we're we're the infrastructure's in place, but we're selling those lots, and then Costco will develop their piece, and then we have the property next door under contract that that developer will come in and, and develop their piece. Yeah, and well, I think that's I think it's a great you know I think it's illustrative of the of the right strategy ultimately because again you had the market come in and, and it dictated that yes there's there's room for commercial on six, and I think it's again through this future 28 acres uh, deal that's adjacent to Costco, and then the Costco that obviously opened last August. I think it's shown that. You know the strategies that you're employing show in the in the right way, and then there's there's this alignment with again city interests with with the market in general. Right, right. and 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 not coming in and overstepping that. Right? right, being able to support your your local market and and keeping it strong. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, thanks. Well, this is this was great. I think hopefully a, a policy sort of table setter. Uh, we're going to be joined shortly by uh, Alyssa Halley Schramm in our planning department, who's going to put a little bit of this into practice in terms of comprehensive planning and how the city gets involved with with kind of future future vision planning for uh, redevelopment for certain areas around the city. Right. It's, it's the foundation for the physical development of our city and not just something that occurs, and Alyssa will explain this much better than I can, but not something that just occurs in the planning department. It is something that all departments in the city follow and have input. And like you said, it sets the table for all the future development that either we uh, are seeing or we want to see in the future. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm now joined by Alyssa Halley Schramm uh, from our planning department. Alyssa, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me here today, Brian. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your your background, kind of your role at the city right now and what brought you to what you're doing right now. Okay. Yes. So um, I am the long range planning administrator here at the city. So um, like the title implies, everything I do is a longer range focus. So really everything looking out at a 5, 10, 20 year planning horizon. Um, how is the city going to look in the future? Um, and we can do that through a lot of different mechanisms, but one of the, um, the things that um, 
the things that the city's really been working on recently is our comprehensive plan. So I spent a lot of my time thinking about how we should be in the future and then how do we get there um, today. So the comprehensive plan sets up that 20 year vision of how the city is going to grow and change. And with the comprehensive plan, um, it sets up land uses. So what the different uses of lands can be in the future. Uh, and the city updated that in 2021, which was a uh, multi-department, multi-year effort, um, also involved lots of hours of citizen engagement and discussions with our planning and zoning commission and city council. Um, but as Natalie mentioned earlier, that comprehensive plan, um, it's really great that it's so current because uh, it helps us set our vision um, and really our marching orders for the next couple of years of, of planning efforts that we're working on. Mm -hmm. So as a strategic value, that again, that that comprehensive plan serves that purpose. But generally, why, why is land use planning important? Yeah, so land use planning um, really sets up what uses can go where in the city. So it's essentially the initial step before you get to zoning. And zoning, zoning is the entitlement that you can actually do on your property. So um, land use sets up what you... Uh, what you can do on your property and how you can use your land. And so um, it's usually painting with slightly broader brush than the actual zoning districts do, um, but looking at areas that would be appropriate for commercial uses or residential uses, and then where also are those in relation to one another. Yeah. So you don't want areas of just residential that you then have to get on a road network and drive really far to commercial. So we look at not just the individual uses, but how do they interact with one another. So when you're looking at the city as a whole, or maybe even drilling down into like something as as kind of hyper local as just a small area neighborhood plan, how do you how do you balance like from from your perspective as a as a planner, how do you balance like preparing for new growth versus preparing for maybe potential redevelopment opportunities in what we would deem as like the older parts of town? That's a really great question. Um, and I think one of the tipping points for us uh, really statewide was annexation changes that happened in 2019. Um, and as Natalie mentioned earlier as well, um, that really changed the game of new growth um, before then had been growing outward. So as your population grows, your boundaries um, typically grow as well as the city goes out and annexes property. Um, the state changed those laws. And so um, in some ways that is um, it can be challenging, but also presents opportunities for looking at infill and redevelopment more strategically. Um, so as we're looking at new growth today, a lot of that actually is looking more at redevelopment areas or infilling properties that um, have not been developed to date. There aren't a whole lot of those left. Um, a lot of the, the what we would call a greenfield um, site have been developed, or at least the easier ones that don't have um, you know floodplain issues or just different constraints on them that may make them a little bit more difficult to develop. Um, so some of your low hanging fruit, your easier areas Areas have already been developed. So now it's those smaller infill properties or looking more at wholesale redevelopment of older areas that um, may make sense with new market pressures or new housing pressures to change into something different. Yeah. And, you know, I, all things, there's there's a life cycle that you follow and, and neighborhoods are just the same. So how does how does that impact as a city? Like when we're trying to identify potential opportunities, where does that that life cycle of those of those areas sort of play into that? Yeah, so there's no hard and fast rule on kind of number of years in which you start to see uh, an area face new development pressures, um, but it definitely can happen as uh, areas age or housing stock ages, um, where you start to see a little bit of a deterioration over time. Some of that is people moving out and wanting to be, you know, farther out in the city, or I think uh, inherently people like the, the new flashy things, so looking at, you know, new housing or new commercial. Um, but one thing I think is really exciting is uh, looking at some of those aging corridors and how could we, we as the city be that more active facilitator to uh, put certain um, processes and planning efforts in place to look at those aging corridors and and how do we improve upon them. So drilling down into those the small area neighborhood plans first what, what's the genesis of that like where, where do those come from where's the thought behind it what what leads to make a decision to say yes this is an area of the city that we want to focus on. Yeah great question so that really stems from the conversation uh, when we updated our comprehensive plan um, so at, at the comprehensive plan level we're looking citywide but um, from that uh, discussion with residents and then also our elected and appointed officials, um, there were certain areas that we kept hearing public comment or um, comments on of, you know, hey, we really need to take a deeper dive in this specific area. So from updating the comprehensive plan, even though we're looking citywide, it helped us identify areas that need a further look. Um, we did what's called scenario planning as well in a couple areas of the city to test different ideas with the public and say, here's three options, kind of the development pattern as is today, a uh, vision under the, the 
the former comprehensive plan and then a vision of if this were totally different, what it could look like. Uh, so we tested those different ideas with the public and uh, some of them were you know, easy that people liked the pattern that was on the ground today, so kind of no change there. But then a couple of the others was were very mixed feelings of, well, we want it to be something different, but we're not quite sure what different looks like. So that was really some of the impetus of um, identifying the first really four planning efforts, um, small area plans that are up uh, for kind of creation after the comprehensive plan was readopted. So of those um, four, excuse me, of the four, three are redevelopment areas. And then one is a um, another look at a small area, um, more of a neighborhood focused plan down on the south side of, of College Station. Okay. And and you referenced a little bit in, in your comments about feedback from the public. How, how critical is that feedback from the public that we receive? Like what, what role is the public generally playing in these plans and yeah. how can they influence it? I would say it's absolutely crucial. So um, all of our planning efforts, whether it's a small area plan or the comprehensive plan are really um, uh, resident driven. So we have a, um, for each planning effort, we have a, a working group that gets more into the weeds with us that helps um, drive some of the, the shaping of how we're gonna lay out a plan, um, the different pieces of, of where we're gonna involve the, the broader public in those efforts. Um, so each each effort has a, a small focus group or working group and then also um, has broad-based public input opportunities. Um, since the, the pandemic, we've also been getting more creative with virtual engagement. So everything we do now has, um, we're putting things online so you can go online and look at maps and, you know, uh, drop essentially pins on maps saying you like things, you don't like things to give us input that way. And we always do public meetings as well. So um, each planning effort is kind of broken into multiple phases where we're getting broad-based public input, setting goals, for the planning effort, and then we get more into the specific um, actions of each plan. So the actions are where the rubber meets the road. It is the what are we doing um, from this these broad-based goals that the community would like to see. And so one of these plans that is in the works right now is for Texas University, which is a, a critical corridor, probably one of the most important, I think, intersections in all of Brazos County. So what, where did that, uh, you know, what is the strategic importance of that? Where was the decision made to say, yes, this is, this is kind of that, that one of those that sort of rises to the top in terms of this is a redevelopment area we want to focus on? Yeah, as you mentioned, it is one of the key corridors of our city, whether you're coming in off of Highway 6 down University um, or you're driving up Texas, Texas Avenue. Um, a lot of the impetus was citizen comment about, uh, you know, older or underperforming commercial uses on the corridor, um, wanting to see a, a better mix of housing types um, closer to campus. Um, but then also uh, a lot of comments broadly about not feeling like you are at Texas A&M until you arrive at that intersection and on campus. So um, looking at that as a main gateway into our community from multiple directions, also from the north, um, wanting to kind of improve upon uh, the sense that you have arrived here in College Station. And we got, you know, while we love our neighbors, uh, Texas A&M, you know, we are not just Texas A&M as well. So giving more of a sense of you have arrived here in the community, um, you are in College Station, kind of welcoming uh, folks into the community. So that was some of the impetus. We heard those comments through the comprehensive plan update. Um, and then this is the first small area plan that we've really um, been been launching kind of full steam ahead okay. through this year. Yeah. And ultimately, like once this comes to um, kind of a, a final point with a plan being presented and, and potentially adopted uh, by our city council, for, for the city, where, where do you see this sort of slotting in on this continuum that we've discussed uh, thus far on on sort of passive versus um, facilitator versus developer. It seems that this is like some vision planning and there may be opportunities to to kind of participate as a facilitator. Is that is that where you see this going? Absolutely. I would say we're an active facilitator in this role. So, um, you know, staff in coordination with our working group and then all of the citizens that um, give input uh, are working on, you know, developing the broad based goals for the area and then the specific actions. So that those actions within a plan are really where the city can plug in. Um, I know you all talked about the Northgate plan um, earlier, and that plan was a, a redevelopment plan as well done about 25, 30 years ago at this point. And there were specific actions in that plan um, that 
that helped set up Northgate as it looks today. So things like developing the Patricia uh, Patricia Street Promenade, um, developing uh, consistent signage and branding. So you've got the Northgate logo with the star that's kind of spread throughout in different areas um, of, of the Northgate area. Um, you also have the city parking garage there where the city constructed a parking garage. So those were all things that were actions within a redevelopment plan from 30 years ago. So I say all that as a tangible example of the types of things that a redevelopment plan can include. Um, and some of those will be city invested projects. So whether that's, you know, a water line upgrade or a sewer line upgrade or a sidewalk improvement or bicycle improvement um, to allow an area to get more dense or provide better connections across the street or safer connections throughout a corridor. Those are all things that um, will be identified as actions within the plan. And then the, um, the city throughout the next really kind of 10 years through our different capital improvement projects actually implement some of those. Now, the individual development pattern, the, the buildings that get, sh get constructed, that is on the private side. So private developers would come in and look at, you know, buying certain properties, um, potentially rehabilitating a, a building that's there or, you know, scraping it and starting from scratch. Um, but one of the things we'll also look at with this planning effort are what are our zoning controls in the area and do we need to revise some of those so that they are um, better aligned with the vision that the residents have been telling us they'd like to see in this area and then also um, uh, making it more predictable for developers to understand what types of development and what types of patterns we'd like to see in the area. Yeah, so it seems like the, the goal of this process ultimately is to have a, a deliverable at the end that you, that is something that you can put into practice. Ultimately, I, if you distill it down to that, is that is, do I kind of have the essence of that or are there, are there other other goals that you're really sort of getting out of this process? I would say you've captured the essence of it. The, the first step is kind of figuring out what the vision is, and then the second is um, putting it into practice. So really, all of our small area plans, including this redevelopment plan, um, are, are action-oriented plans of things that we, the city, have committed to do um, and are going to work toward uh, for the next 10 years, really. And this is, uh, as we mentioned, it, it is ongoing. What does the timeline look like right now? Yeah, we kicked off this planning effort in December of 2022. Um, we've had a series of public meetings and working group meetings um, in the last uh, six months or so. And uh, right now we're gonna be a little bit more behind the scenes throughout the summer months as we uh, work to write the plan. So we've got our goal statements um, nailed down through all the public input so far. Um, and now we're really refining the action. So what are these very specific projects um, that could be included in this plan that we then work on over time? Uh, so the public can look forward to uh, seeing a draft version of the plan this fall that'll likely be uh, later in August early September and then from there once we get public feedback on the draft version it will be going before our Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council for their um, final adoption and approval of the planning effort. In the meantime um, people can go to cstx.gov slash Texas University not to be confused with the University of Texas um, but Texas University That's too. Good. Very, <laughs> yeah you gotta be careful. We thought that one out yeah. um, but uh, they can visit the website and learn more about the plan effort uh, and, and we'll post our public meeting dates as well as we start to determine them. Awesome. All right. What have we missed? Is there anything I didn't ask that we need to, that we need to put out there? Um, I think we've captured it all. Okay. Thank you so Sounds much for good. having me today. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. And thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time on All Up In Your Business. Mm -hmm.